The Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation brings you Crime Photographer. Say, Mr. Marvin, who do you think will go to the Rose Bowl this year? Well, I, I don't know, Ethelbert. Do you think the weather will turn any colder, Tony? Oh, I can't say, Casey. Tony? You like skirts the way they are this year? Or do you think they should be uh, oh, shorter? Can't answer that one, Anne. Tony, haven't you anything to say this evening? Oh, definitely, Casey. Anchor Hawking is the most famous name in glass. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Tony Marvin. Every week at this time, the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, and its more than 10,000 employees bring you another adventure of Casey Crime Photographer, ace cameraman who covers the crime news of a great city. Written by Alonzo Dean Cole, our adventure for tonight, The Camera Bug. Mid-afternoon, the photographic department of the Morning Express. Casey sits sprawled at his battered desk wearing the scowl of a man who began his day with a dull razor and cold coffee. The door opens and a young man enters. Excuse me, Mr. Casey in? Mm, yeah, that's me. Uh, my name's Forster, Mr. Casey. Uh, Alan Forster. I've heard a lot about you. Yeah, I know. I'm on all the sucker lists. What are you selling? Oh, nothing. Well, that is, well, you see, I'm a photographer. Uh, <laughs> who isn't? Sometimes I think every guy in the world is a camera bug. What's on your mind? Looking for a job? Uh, yeah. See the city editor. His name's Burke. Four, four floor above here. Well, I've already seen Mr. Burke, and he says there aren't any vacancies here. Oh. I've been to all the other papers, too. I thought you might advise me how to get a start. Uh, uh, how old are you? 21. You got a job now? I work in a camera supply store. I know a lot about taking pictures. Honest, I do. And... Well, my wife and I decided that it's time for me to break into the line I've always wanted. And you've got a wife, you got a job with regular hours, and you want to break into my kind of racket? Yeah. Oh, boy. My advice is forget it. This is the lousiest game there is. You're out at all hours. People shove you around. You can risk your hide to get a good shot, and the city desk may stick it on page 10 if it's used at all. This is a dog's life, kid. Keep out of it. Yeah, but you get around and you see things. Oh, you see things. I, I guess you believe all you hear on the radio. Huh? <laughs> well, okay, camera bug. Here's the only way I know how to break in. You put in about 12 hours a day on the streets with your eyes open and your camera ready. Occasionally, you'll get a news picture you can sell. If you're lucky, you may get a real hot shot that you can trade to the city editor for a steady job. But you've got to be lucky. Huh? That's all I can tell you. Oh, thanks a million, Mr. Casey. I'll do exactly as you say. Yeah, if you do, you're letting yourself in for a lot of grief. Excuse me, old man. <clears throat> Hello. This is Ann Casey. You busy? No, uh, not very. Oh, I got an awful cold. How about going over to the Blue Note? Hmm. I'll meet you there in five minutes. Okay. Gee, you got got to rush somewhere in five minutes. That means an important assignment, huh? Hmm. Yeah, very important. Well, I, I won't keep you, but thanks again a lot. <laughs> Good luck to you, kid. Uh, what's your name again? Uh, Forster. Alan Forster. Well, so long, Alan. Drop in again sometime, and remember, I've warned you, guys in this racket lead a dog's life. Um, da -dee -dee. Another small beer, Ethelbert. <laughs> How about you, Annie? Something's good for your cold, huh? Mm-mm. No. I feel fine now, Casey. We've been here half an hour. We'd better go back to the office. <laughs> Annie sounds like a frog. Well, don't worry, <laughs> Froggy. <laughs> City desk knows where we are. Burke will phone if anybody calls or anything comes up. Pretty soft for you two, I'd say. Wished I was in a business where I could take time off in the middle of an afternoon. Hey, listen to this guy, Annie, will you? You should have the kind of job we have, Ethelbert. That's oh, right. Sure, sure. I hear you crabbing about it all the time. But you should endure what us bartenders goes through. How'd you like to wash and wipe a million glasses every day? And flush out the beer pipes? <laughs> and answer the... Yeah. 
Oh, excuse me, the telephone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Blue Note Cafe, Ethel Burke speaking. Is that here, Mr. Burke? Just a minute. Uh-oh. Your city desk, Casey. All right, give me. Casey speaking. Uh, now, now, Burke, we're not always here. It just seems like always. Okay. Yeah, I got it. 12th Street, just south of Locust. Homicide Bureau's already on the job, huh? Well, you know, when you get a delayed report like this, we can't bring you anything that everybody else hasn't already gotten ahead of us. Okay, we're on our way. Goodbye. What is it, Casey? Come on, Annie. We got to see what some shooting's about. Shooting? Yep, slight case of murder, Ethelbert. Goodbye, pal. So long. Say, Casey, you didn't pay. Oh, well, bartending's a dog's life. Got the street roped off. Yeah, we'll leave the car here, Annie. Come on. You're lifting a stretcher into the morgue. Well, I'm gonna get a shot of that. Okay. Well, that means the medical examiner's finished his job. Now, let's get inside those lines. Will you let us okay. throw, please? Oh, there's Sergeant Flanagan. Hey, Flanagan! Uh, oh, hey, Casey. Hi. Hello, Miss Williams. Hi. You two are getting here kind of late, aren't you? Now, don't rub it in. Hey, who did they just haul away in that meat wagon? Oh, uh, the not too much lamented murder victim was a gent unfavorably known as Max Blake. Max Blake? The lawyer? Oh, don't let decent lawyers hear you call him that, Miss Williams. Max Blake was a shyster. That rat wasn't even straight with his own clients. Well, the cops know who killed him? We not only know who killed him, but we've already got the mugs who did it. This case is all sewed up. Give, Sergeant. Let's have the details so I can get them to my paper. Okay. According to eyewitnesses, the late Max Blake, who just stepped out of the barbershop behind us here, suddenly flopped in the middle of the sidewalk about where you're standing now. At the same time, a gunshot was heard, and a second later, a green sedan, which had been standing across the street, started away in such a big hurry that it crashed into the back of a truck, only a few feet away from the traffic cop on the corner. Who do you think they were? Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny, huh? They were Butch Silver and Tony Russo. Boy, they're a nice pair of hot shots. Two of the sweetest gorillas in town. And you've got them dead to rights, Sergeant? I told you and Casey all I'm allowed to say now to the newspapers. You'll have to get anything else from Captain Logan. Yeah, where is Logan, by the in way? In the back room of the barbershop there questioning witnesses. All right, come on, Annie, let's go in. Wait a minute, Casey. What? Nobody goes oh, in there. Oh, planning. I got my orders, Casey. Yeah, hey, look, you and I are pals. Sure, but you keep out of that barbershop, pal. Is that nice? It's what goes. No, we if you'll be a nice guy, Casey, and won't try any tricks to get where you're not wanted, as you've done too many times before, I'll give Miss Williams a tip. A tip? Oh, it's not anything I'm not allowed to tell you, understand? It's just something I forgot to mention to the other newspaper boys and girls. <laughs> All right, it's a deal, Flanagan, no tricks. What's the tip? One of the witnesses to the shooting is quite an important guy. Who? Richard M. Craigler. What, the contractor? Biggest in town. Hey, I interviewed Clago when he got the city paving contract last year. His offices are somewhere around here. Right across the street. Yeah, of course. I recognize the funny old-fashioned building now. The only elevator it's got is hidden in back of the stairs. Of course, I couldn't find it. I had to walk up to Clago's office on the third floor. Say, Flanagan, did Clago uh, uh, see those gorillas in the car shoot, Blake? Well, he says that... Oh, here he comes out of the barbershop. You can ask him yourself. Huh? Oh, Mr. Clago... Uh, I'm Ann Williams of the Morning Express. We met last year. Oh, yes, yes. How do you do, Miss Williams? Now, hold it, will you? Huh? Thanks. I hope you don't mind my snapping a picture of you, Mr. Clagle. Well, no, no, not at all. Mr. Clagle, will you give us an eyewitness account of what happened? Well, as I just told Captain Logan in there, I happened to be at the window of my private office just across the street when the shot was fired. Oh, your uh, private office is on the third floor, as I remember, right? That's right. I saw this man, Blake, fall. Then I saw a green sedan start up and crash into a truck. I hurried out to the elevator. The operator brought me downstairs. I saw the man in the sedan arrested, and, uh, well, that's all. Well, did you see the shot fired from the sedan? No, I can't say that, Miss Williams. But the sedan is obviously where the bullet came from. The medical examiner says it must have been fired from about five feet above the street level, which means the killer sat in an automobile or stood on the sidewalk or street. Now, only one shot was fired. Huh? Uh, that's all. Uh, Mr... Uh... Uh, Casey's the name. Uh, both uh... gorillas in that sedan are dead shots, Casey. Uh, Sergeant Flanagan, come in here. Oh, yes, sir. Uh, Captain Logan wants me. I'll see you later. Yeah, tell Logan I want to see him, Sarge, will you? Oh, uh, Mr. Casey. 
Mr. Casey. Huh? I'm Alan Forster. You remember we were talking? Oh, sure, sure, kid. But what were you doing in that barber shop? Oh, I was a witness to the shooting. Oh, wasn't I, Mr. Clayco? Uh, police questioned us both. Uh, that's right, young man. I did as you told me, Mr. Casey. I was on the spot when things happened, and I had a camera with me. And I got two shots of that Blake fellow from almost where we're standing now. One almost as I heard the gun fired, and the other right after he hit the ground. You didn't tell the police about taking any pictures. Oh, no, Mr. Clagle. I wanted Casey to have these shots. I I've got hot stuff, haven't I, Casey? Exclusive news pictures, the kind that'll get me a job on the Express? Yeah, well, let's get to my office, develop your film, and see just what you got. Oh, no, let me develop the film at home, Mr. Casey. I'd like to do a complete job on it. Huh? Well, all right, but blow them up to 8 by 10 and be sure to use a fine grain developer. Oh, you'll see the kind of job I can do. I'll have the prints at your office inside of 45 minutes. Oh, uh, which way is your home, young man? I live on Nelson Street, Mr. Clagle. Oh, good. I'm going in that direction. My car's around the corner. I'll drop you off. Oh, that'll be swell. Oh, well, Mr. Clagle. Yes, Captain Logan. I want to ask you a few more questions. Will you come back into the barber shop, please? Well, I have important business to attend to, Captain. There's but... nothing so important as this murder right now. Come in, please. Well, I'll have to do as you say, of course. Now, when do Miss I... Williams and I get in there, Logan? Oh, so you two are here. We've sure been are. waiting for hours. I'll beat it quick, Mr. Casey. See you at the express. Okay, fellas. I'll be with you in just a minute, Mr. Clago. And why have you and Casey been waiting, Miss Williams? <laughs> well, Logan, when you start clowning right after a murder, it means you've got an airtight case. Well, it isn't quite that yet, Casey. I've got some loose ends to tie up. Oh, what are they? Well, the medical examiner took a thirty-eight caliber slug out of Blake's body... And we found guns on both of the hoods that were in that sedan, but they were forty five. Well, they must have thrown the murder gun away. Sure they did. Somebody picked it up, of course, and hasn't turned it in. Well, they tried a fast getaway. That's ample indication of their guilt. How about motive? Almost anyone had a motive to kill Max Blake. He was an all-around louse. Yeah, it's going to take a lot more work than I first expected. Seems I never get an easy case. We cops lead an absolute dog's life, Casey. <laughs> The story will continue in just a moment. You know, Alex, I really like good, wholesome beer and ale. So do I, Tony. Ah, but there's one thing that's always bothered me, and that's the way empty bottles clutter up the back porch and basement. And that's one of the big reasons for the new Anchor Glass one-way no-deposit bottle. Oh, you're right, Alex. You never have to bother about returning empties to the store. When the bottle is empty, you get rid of it as you would any other food container. And you don't have to bother about deposits. No more fussing with extra pennies. And the new Anchor Glass one-way no-deposit bottle is a glass bottle. And because it's a glass bottle, it brings you beer and ale that tastes as beer and ale should taste. Clean, clear, sparkling, unaffected by any foreign flavors. No cloudiness, no discoloration. Beer that's brewery bright. Is it any wonder that the new Anchor Glass one-way no-deposit bottle is sweeping America? For perfect flavor, demand beer in glass bottles. For extra convenience, demand your favorite brand in the new Anchor Glass one-way no-deposit bottle. A product of Anchor Hawking. The most famous name in glass. I've got the prints for you, Mr. Casey. Told you I'd have them here in your office inside of 45 minutes. <laughs> hey, you're a fast worker, Al. Oh, I'd have made it even sooner if a guy hadn't stopped me outside your building. Guy wanted to buy the pictures. Oh, who? Oh, he's from another paper, the Globe. He offered me $200 for the shots I got. Well, how did the Globe know that you... Well, had... he said somebody who saw me take them tipped off a Globe reporter. Uh -huh. well, that could happen, all right, I guess. But I wouldn't let him even see what I've got. These pictures are yours. Yeah, well, don't say that until we talk to City Desk. Burke might not go 200 bucks worth. Oh, I don't care about that. It's a job I want. Well, let's see your prints. Come on. Yeah, here. Mm-hmm. Nice work, fella. Ah, you can really see Blake starting his fall in this one. The body's sagging, growing limp. Yeah, he just hit the ground in this one. I shot it as quick as I could wind the film and focus. Hey, these are worth 200 bucks and a steady job here besides. Come on, we're going upstairs to Burke, and I'm going to tell him just that. Ah, 
Well, $100 for the two pictures is my limit, Casey. And we don't need any new staff photographers. Burke, no other paper in town will have these shots. They're worth every cent of the 200 bucks the Globe has already offered, and we can use this young fella. Are you telling me how to run this paper? Oh. It's okay, Mr. Casey. I'll take the 100 well, You're crazy if you do, Alan. You seem to be acting as this young man's agent rather than as an employee of the Express, Casey. What's to be your rake off on this deal? Uh, you don't mean that, do you, Burke? Uh... No. But a hundred is tough. Come on, kid, let's go. Okay. Uh, Casey, you know I didn't... Sure, know. sure, but someday you'll make one of your... Ah, uh, nuts to you. Oh, gee, Mr. Casey, I'm terribly sorry. Never mind. All right. I told you this newspaper racket was a dog's life, fellow. Now maybe you believe me. Take these pictures to the Globe and get your 200 bucks. Well, I hate Well, you'd be crazy to do anything else. Uh, did you, uh, make any extra prints of those shots? Yeah, two of each. Well, could I have the extras? I won't use them, of course. Just that they're nice, clean camera jobs. I'd like them to remember Bert by. Sure, here they are. Thanks. But take the others to your globe guy right now. In this racket, a guy has to sell to the highest bidder. I tell you, it's a dog's life. Casey, you've been sitting at this bar for over two hours now. Ain't you ever going back to work? Mm. Well, I'm not sure I am, Ethelbert, at the Express. Oh, now, stop being sore at Bert. You know he's pretty decent sore at underneath. Underneath. And I'm tired of digging underneath Bert to look for his good points. You know, for two cents, I'd go over to the Globe myself and strike Curtis for a job. Now, there's a city editor who knows values. And he's also an okay guy, too. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Casey. Huh? huh? Mr. Curtis. Hello, oh. Miss Williams. And when do you want to start to work on the Globe, Casey? Uh, <clears throat> well, I... I haven't exactly made up my mind to make any change, Mr. <laughs> Curtis. I... You're just crabbing about something, eh? You will never leave the Express. The Express? Well... Good paper. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, but we sure let you pull one over us on us today, getting those exclusive murder pictures for only 200 bucks. What exclusive murder pictures? The Blake killing, of course. Give Mr. Curtis a drink on me, Ethelbert, will you? Sure. The... Oh, excuse me, I... there's the bar for... We didn't get any exclusives of the Blue Blake killing. Cafe, well, you Ethelbert bought the stuff speaking. that Forster kid got. Forster kid? Sure, Alan Forster. He's a young camera bug. I oh, never heard of it. Well, uh, you'll have to speak louder, uh, ma'am. Wait I a minute. Hear Say, what, uh, Curtis, huh? didn't you send a guy from the Globe to buy those shots from... Casey, I haven't the vaguest idea of what uh, you're talking about. Casey. I... The call's for you, Casey, and Mrs. Huh? Forster on the wire. Mrs. Forster? Uh-huh, you want to talk to her? I'll say I do. Miss Give Williams, me... would you be good enough, if you can, please, to tell me something? Hey, uh, uh, hello, hello, Casey speaking. They told me at the Express to call this number, Mr. Casey. I'm Alan Forrester's wife. He's with you, isn't he? No. Oh, but you know where he is. No. Oh, but something's happened to him. Huh? What do you mean? Well, almost three hours ago, he phoned me at the place where I work about the pictures he'd taken of that murder. Yeah? He said he was going to develop them, then meet you and phone me back. But he didn't phone, and... Somebody's been in our apartment. Somebody's been... Well, I found the lock on our door broken and, and the closet Alan uses for his dark room. The things had been broken and knocked around. Has anything else in the apartment been disturbed? No, just the things in the dark room. Oh, Mr. Casey, what do you think's happened to him? I don't know. But I'll do my best to locate your husband. Do you think you can? Now, take it easy and don't worry. Goodbye for now. Goodbye. Annie, Annie, come on. Excuse us, Mr. Curtis, will you? Where are we going, Casey? my car across the street. The copies of those murder pictures are there in my equipment case, and I want to take a very careful look at them. Oh, Annie. If I'd only looked carefully at these prints before. What do you see, Casey? How Blake was murdered. How Blake? Yes, look. Look. When Forster took the pictures, his lens was stopped down to get a good depth of focus. Yeah. He got not only Blake, but a sharp picture of the building across the street. Yeah, I Well, in the see. first picture, the bullet has just struck Blake. He, he's slumping. He's beginning to fall. And a ground floor window of that building is partially open, Annie. Look. Yeah, just a few inches. Yeah, but in the second picture, which shows Blake lying on the sidewalk, that window's closed. He was shot from behind that window, and the killer closed it right after he fired. Right, that's it. Now, look at this third floor window in both pictures. 
It's the one that Richard M. Klegel said he was standing behind when he heard the shot. Well, did you see anybody there? No, Casey. Hmm. Klegel could have gone down to the first floor and waited for Blake to come out of the barber shop and... Yeah. Then, after he shot him, Klegel closed the window, did a quick dash up the stairs to the third floor and rang the elevator bell. Yeah. The operator picked him up there and Klegel was supplied with a pretty good alibi, Annie, because the bullet entered Blake's body on a horizontal line. He couldn't have been shot from the third floor. But Klegel's a reputable businessman, Casey. Why did he kill Blake? Well, never mind. That doesn't matter now. Point is, he must have killed him. And Klegel is the only person beside you, Forster, Burke, and me who knew about those pictures. He was with us when the kid told about taking him, remember? Oh, yeah. And he ought to take the kid home right afterwards. And if Captain Logan hadn't detained yeah, him... Yeah, he'd have gotten the films then, sure. He sent somebody to wait outside the express building to buy those pictures. But Forster wouldn't sell until after he'd seen me. And then I played into his hands by telling the kid not to accept Burke's chiseling offer. You know, the phony Globe reporter got him into a car after he left you and kidnapped him. Because the kid only had prints of the pictures, Aunt. Clayco had to have the negatives, too. So he or the guy working with him broke into Forster's apartment and got him. Evidently, Forster didn't let on that he'd given me a set of prints or I'd have received a call from him, too. Well, maybe they killed him by now. Well, Annie, if they've killed that kid, I'm partly responsible. Oh, that's crazy. i got to find Logan right away. We're going to start for headquarters as soon as I can unlock this ignition. Don't make a move. <laughs> Clegg. There's a gun in this pocket, Casey. You remember that, too, Miss Williams, and that a man in danger of the electric chair will stop at nothing to protect himself. I'm uh, getting into the back seat. Start your motor, Casey, and drive as I direct. Okay. Guess you heard what we were talking about. And not by accident. Young Foster did say you had prints of those pictures. I waited a long time for you. Now start driving. Straight ahead for the time being. That gun makes you the boss. Mind giving us a hint of where we're going? We're joining young Foster. He hasn't been harmed yet. Drive right up to that big door, Casey. Okay. What is this place? A little waterfront storage house I own, Miss Williams. Stop here, Casey. All right, now what? Get out of the car. I notice you've placed the pictures I want in your equipment case. Bring the case with you. All right. And be very careful. Bob, open up. Yeah, right away, boys. Well, I see you got the guy you went after plus a dame. Yeah, Bob, just as you got Foster. Now step inside, you people. Casey. Hello, Alan. See, they've got you nicely tied up. Now, that guy Bob brought me here. He's a fellow said he was on the globe. I told him about the prints you had before I knew he was a yeah, phony. It's okay, pal. Now you can hand over those prints, Casey. I guess I'll have to, Clegel. What are your plans for the three of us? Can't you guess? A one-way ride? A boat ride. Late tonight. On one of my cement barges. Oh, Casey. I hate to do this, Miss Williams. <clears throat> But you people are very dangerous to me. More dangerous than Max Blake was. Why did you kill Blake? Never mind that. Give me the pictures in your plate case. Okay. Uh, don't let him think he's missing that case, boss. There may be a gut in there. There's nothing in this case but films and flash bulbs and your pictures. Maybe not, but take your hands out of there. Uh, all right. You're the doctor. Get him yourself, then. He's got something in his hands, boss. Can't you see they're only flash bulbs? I come out so you can get at the princes. Unstrap the case from his shoulder, Bob. I've, I've got it. Take out the pictures. I want to be sure. Oh, oh, oh. You got a flash bulb between the eyes, Clayton. Shoot him, Bob. My eyes are cut. That's right. I, I can't see. I, I'm blind. He's got my gun, Clayton. You shouldn't try to handle a gun and a film case at the same time. Bob, Bob. You got him, Casey. And here's one for you, Clayton. <laughs> you got them both, they're out. Annie. Yeah? Will you get my camera from the car while I watch these mugs? I'm going to use some flash bulbs now to get a few front page pictures. And if Burke doesn't put them on the front page, I will take a job on the Globe. Oh, now, when did I hear that one before?
We'll join the crowd of the Blue Note in just a moment. If men had to clean pots and pans every night, they'd really do something about it. They'd go right out and invest in a complete set of Fire King oven glass. If only because Fire King oven glass is so amazingly easy to clean. Now, if you've been using ordinary pots and pans, you have no idea how much kitchen drudgery Fire King oven glass will save you. You see, Fire King oven glass is a special non-porous surface that's literally mirror smooth. The result of a scientific process exclusive with Fire King. And then, too, you save dishwashing by using a single Fire King baking dish to serve, bake, and store leftovers. Now, you'll find a wide variety of Fire King casseroles, pie plates, and baking dishes in all sizes at your favorite chain and other retail stores where household glass is sold, all at amazingly low prices, all guaranteed for two years against oven breakage. Beautiful, practical, inexpensive Fire King oven glass, a product of Anchor Hawking. The most famous name in glass. Why did Klegel kill that guy, Max Blake, Casey? Hmm, well, Ethelbert, shyster criminal lawyers like Blake are sometimes blackmailers. Well, Blake was. Clagel was paying him and finally got tired of it. Yeah. Clagel knew that Blake patronized the barber shop across from his office building and invariably went there on Saturday afternoon. All he had to do was to watch and to wait for him. Hmm? He figured out a pretty good alibi from the elevator operator. He made it look better by bringing those two gunmen, Silver and Russo, to the neighborhood with a phony telephone message. Yeah, you see, they, they thought they were to meet somebody there. But Klegel had framed them as a pair of natural suspects. They knew that with their record, it wasn't healthy to be caught at the scene of a killing, so when they heard the shot, they tried to beat it, which made them really look guilty, you think? Mm, I see. After what the Forster kid went through, I guess he'll be glad to go on working in a store. Yeah, oh, no. No, no. He's got the stuff it takes, the kid. <laughs> Casey's browbeating Burke into putting Alan Forster on the regular staff. Ethelbert. Yeah? Oh, well, he's taking the job on his own responsibility, though. Yes, sir, I've warned the kid. And now he's seen for himself that press photographers... Lead our dog's life. Yeah, that's right. We certainly do. <laughs> Casey, as my sister Edna says, quote, Demis complains about leading a dog's life. Seldom want to trade places with any other breed of animal. Yeah, unquote. Hmm. Uh, give Casey another Fido biscuit, Ethelbert. Uh, pour it in his usual glass. Prime Photographer, starring Stotts Cotsworth as Casey, is brought to you each Thursday by the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation, makers of Fire King Oven Glass, Anchor Glass Containers, Anchor Caps and Closures, all products of Anchor Hawking. The most famous name in glass. Photographer is directed by John Dietz. The original music is by Archie Blyer, and the program features Miss Jan Minor as Anne and John Gibson as Ethelbert. Herman Chittison is the Blue Note pianist. Your National Guard is destined to play a more important part than ever before in America's security plans. The National Guard offers young men regular army pay and training without interference with their normal civilian life. If you're between the ages of 17 and 35, married or single, Join your local unit of the National Guard. This is Tony Marvin saying goodnight for the Anchor Hawking Glass Corporation of Lancaster, Ohio, with offices in all principal cities of the United States and Canada. Thursday night on CBS is the biggest show in town, so stay tuned for exciting dramatizations on Reader's Digest Radio Edition, which follows immediately over most of these stations. This 
is CBS Columbia Broadcasting System.